commendably proud of this year's Lang Langenberg Award recipient, who you'll meet shortly. But I want to uh, extend a special welcome to Chancellor Emeritus Donald N. Langenberg, whose leadership of the University System of Maryland from 1990 to 2002 helped transform the USM into one of the nation's strongest public university systems. On a personal note, Dr. Langenberg hired me in 2002, and while I'll leave it to others to evaluate the wisdom of that particular decision, I'm grateful to have been chosen to lead the university, one of the, the unique universities in Baltimore and Maryland. I have the honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Langenberg's successor, Chancellor Britt Kerwin. Britt is a nationally recognized authority on critical issues shaping the higher educational landscape. His voice is being heard with serious concerns and ideas of how to deal in the coming years. His leadership of the USM during the past decade has been truly remarkable as we've increased the quality of our educational offerings and expanded the reach of those offerings while maintaining access and affordability, the real measure of public institutional success. As a president, it's invaluable to have a mentor, boss, colleague, and friend who knows what the jobs entail, and Britt's leadership of College Park, Ohio State, and certainly coming back here to this system, gives him perspective and a balance that is very unique. And perhaps because of his background as a mathematician, Britt understands the true values of things. He knows that higher education has always been at the heart of the American dream, and that it is our job to make sure that that remains and continues into the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming our chancellor, our friend, Britt Kerwin. Bob, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and welcome to all of you uh, for today's uh, Langenberg Lecture. Before I turn to the subject of today's uh, gathering, I, I, I want to note that, as Bob mentioned, um, he was appointed president in uh, uh, 2002. That's the same year I became uh, chancellor. And so we sort of started together in, the, in our uh, current roles. And I had the uh, privilege of participating in a um, ceremony commem commemorating Bob's 10th anniversary as uh, president of this university recently. And I think we all recognize that uh, thanks uh, in large measure to, to his leadership, uh, it has been a remarkable decade uh, for this uh, university. UB has once again become a four-year institution. Uh, the overall student enrollment has nearly doubled. Uh, the University of Baltimore has strengthened its role as an integral part of the social, cultural, and intellectual life of Baltimore. The, the physical presence of this campus has been transformed, uh, highlighted by the new, soon to be open, John and Francis Angelos Law Center. Uh, and it is a magnificent building indeed, as I'm sure the law school faculty who've had a, the opportunity to tour it uh, recognize. Actually, we owe a lot, I think, for the success of this uh, building to Bob Embry, who I believe is here the, today, here somewhere. Uh, Bob Embry and the Able Foundation, because they actually uh, made a, a grant to have a design competition to build this building. And the results are of that um, uh, competition will benefit us for years to come. So. Bob, we, um, we thank you for your great leadership over this past uh, uh, decade. Um, the Langenberg uh, Lecture uh, is, has been established as an ongoing tribute to Don Langenberg and his uh, commitment to, uh, ed his lifelong commitment to education and as a tribute to his uh, contributions and accomplishments as Chancellor of the University System of Maryland. In keeping with Don's vision, the Langenberg Lecture was developed as more than just an informative presentation from a nationally renowned leader. Instead, it is intended to be a call to action from a visionary who can inspire and motivate those of us in higher education 
to rethink our approach uh, to teaching and learning. As a lecture rotates uh, among uh, USM campuses, it is complemented, as uh, was mentioned, with the presentation of the Langenberg Award, uh, presented to an outstanding student um, from the host institution who has shown great promise and a commitment to her career in education. As you will soon uh, learn, this, this year's award recipient, Maria Serdokas, is ideally suited for this honor. In its brief history, the Langenberg Lecture has attracted top flight intellectuals. The inaugural lecture, the Langenberg Lecture, was given by Nobel Prize physicist Leon Letterman. The second uh, presentation was uh, Langenberg Lecture was by Norm Augustine, former CEO of Lockheed Martin, and I'm proud to say a member of our Board of Regents. Through the years, honored guests have included Vartan Gagoyan, the president of the Carnegie Corporation, Uri Kreisman, a professor of mathematics at the University of Texas, and Carl Wyman, a Nobel Prize winner, and until recently, the associate director of, for science at the White House uh, Policy of Science and Technology Policy. The uh, 2013 Langenberg Lecture will be delivered by Harold Hongju Koo, who is a sterling professor of international law at Yale University School of Law, uh, and until earlier this year, legal advisor for the Department of State under President Barack Obama. Uh, Don will talk more about Harold in, in his introduction, but I would like to highlight one element of his career that I find especially inspiring. Uh, his long-standing commitment uh, to human rights uh, work. Uh, I look forward to his lecture and learning more about his perspectives on e education. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce the man whose lifelong commitment to lifelong education inspired today's gathering, a highly effective and indefatigable champion of the University System of Maryland and all of higher education uh, please welcome to the podium Chancellor Emeritus Don Langenberg. Bob and Britt, thank you so much for your kind but perhaps undeserved words. Um, I have several privileges today. The first of them is to present uh, the award to the chosen student. Her name is Maria Sardokas. She's a second year law student here at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She's working toward uh, an international law concentration. She grew up thinking globally. One of her grandparents taught her German when she was a child, took her traveling around Germany when she was in high school. On the other side, her other grandparents taught her about her Lithuanian heritage, and she was able to visit Lithuania one summer as well. She attended Loyola University here in Baltimore as an undergraduate, majoring in English, with a double minor in French and in writing. She spent a junior year abroad in Louvain, Belgium, which was a real lifetime experience. She volunteered that year at a local Flemish high school as a native English speaker and someone who was not all that much older than the high school students there she was uniquely suited to help with English classes by leading small group activities of many, many different kinds. Now she's in law school. She's a member of the International Law Society, a student fellow for the Center for International and Comparative Law, where she's been working to reach out to other law schools around the world in order to create a more active line of communication between students here in Baltimore and their international counterparts. She's also a member of the University of Baltimore Law Review, Phi Delta Phi Honor Society, 
and the Women's Bar Association. And she's currently interning at the Maryland Court of Special Appeals. While I was serving once upon a time as Chancellor of the University of Illinois at Chicago, I had some substantive interactions with the large uh, large Lithuanian community in Chicago and they honored me by proclaiming me to be an honorary Lithuanian. <laughs> and so it's with especially great pleasure that I present this award to a fellow Lithuanian. <laughs> I wasn't aware that I was supposed to do this, but um, <laughs> I guess I'd just like to thank um, Professor Langenberg here for having this event every year and for having this award that I'm now getting to participate in. And I'd also like to thank the, the Center for International and Comparative Law and Professor Sellers for having these kinds of events, making them available to students here and giving me this kind of opportunity. So thank you. My second privilege is to introduce our speaker. He is the ninth Langenberg lecturer. Harold Coe is a leading expert on public and private international law and on national security and human rights. For several years recently, he served as legal advisor to the State Department in President Obama's first term on leave from the Yale Law School where he is a uh, faculty member. He holds an endowed chair as professor there of international law. And he's been awarded the 2013 Secretary of State Distinguished Service Award for his service in the federal government. As Chancellor Kerwin noted, he's received more than 30 awards for his human rights work. And we would all agree, I think, that democratizing education is fundamental to human rights all around the world. Early in his career, he served as clerk to Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun. Subsequently wrote about that experience in a law review article entitled, quote, Unveiling Justice Blackmun unquote. <laughs> but my favorite title of all his writings is one he wrote for the Yale Law School Journal, quote, setting the world right, unquote. And I presume that he's going to tell you how to go about doing that in the next hour or so. So I personally am looking forward with much anticipation to his lecture today and learning more about his perspectives on education and how we might go about setting the world right. Professor Cole. Well, thank you, uh, Chancellor Langenberg. Thank you, Chancellor Kerwin. Thank you, President Bogomolny. And uh, congratulations to Maria for this award. One of the things I had a good fortune to do in the last couple of weeks after coming back from the government is I actually got a dumpster. And 
And the reason is that my office was so messy there was no place to sit. <laughs> and uh, I've been going through my papers and throwing them into the dumpster through a chute that's next to my window. <laughs> and at a certain point, I was thinking, this is a waste of time. I should just pick it all up and throw it in. And then I found a file, an old file, and I opened it up. <coughs> and there were the passports of my parents when they came to the United States uh, in the early 40s. And along with that was the, my father's ticket from the uh, Waterman steamship, $385 which brought him from Pusan, Korea, to the west coast of the United States. And in there, finally, was a letter from Harvard Law School, Paul Freund, offering my father his fellowship at the Harvard Law School for the year 1951, which was exactly $1,000. <laughs> and uh, this is what made it possible for me to grow up in America. And I was thinking of this uh, when Maria got this wonderful award. I also want to pay special tribute to the entire uh, uh, university system of Maryland, and particularly the University of Baltimore, which is such a jewel in the crown. Uh, what an extraordinary job uh, all of the leaders of the school who I met with today have done in constructing this beautiful facility, the new law school, which is to open. And we especially uh, congratulate you on the selection as your dean of Ron Weish, uh, who is not only a beloved colleague of mine from the U.S. Justice Department, where he did such an extraordinary job as uh, Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs in the first Obama term, uh, but he's also a graduate of both Yale Law School and Yale College, where unbeknownst to many, he was uh, a star performer in Guys and Dolls. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, and I just say, when you see a guy reach for stars in the sky, <laughs> Um, and when he's someone who says, luck be a lady tonight, you picked the right guy to be your <laughs> dean. Um, I have spent the last 30 years now in a number of different roles, 30 years as an international law professor, 20 years as a human rights lawyer, 10 in the U.S. government, and five as a dean. And just to show that I really did it, uh, here's, a, <laughs> here's some pictures that I found <coughs> Uh, from my various travels. Here is uh, upper left uh, my appearance uh, before the Human Rights Council in Geneva of the United Nations in the bottom. Uh, this is at uh, landing in Bagram Air Base, Afghanistan. This is in uh, Moscow. This is in uh, Guantanamo. It's a place I spent a lot of time. Uh, this is on an air flight uh, in a distant part of Afghanistan. This is in the Parthenon during the economic crisis. Uh, this is in Korea during the funeral of the Nobel Prize winning president Kim Dae-jung. And I appeared in many courts uh, at the International Court of Justice. Uh, in the back is my former senior advisor Phil Spector, now vice president for strategic initiatives at uh, Johns Hopkins University here in Baltimore, who uh, was my uh, dear friend and colleague in that expedition as in so many. Here is the European Court of Human Rights, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and the International Criminal Court with a group of our students. This one the students might recognize. <laughs> 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 I became famous because of it. After Libya, <coughs> we went from Malta into Libya, and we were on a military transport, uh, large open space, but they had room for four business class seats, and Secretary Clinton and her aides sat in the front, and myself and uh, Jeff Feltman uh, sat in the second row, and then uh, Secretary Clinton was texting. In fact, I texted to her at one point, look over your right shoulder, which she found amusing. And this has now appeared in many, many um, blogs, and my mother said, who is the woman sitting in front of you? In the <laughs> 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 and um, as you can imagine, on all of these travels, I've been thinking more about this particular question. Uh, as the world gets smaller, as it's shrinking, uh, as you're able to travel anywhere uh, and communicate anywhere, uh, there's a question, how best to teach globalization? And I hope you forgive me if as a lawyer I ask how best to teach globalization and law. And I say this with great um, uh, awareness 
of how much the world has shrunk in our very lifetime. Um, there was a time where if you could sit on a park bench and the knowledge of the world could flow into your lap, you would have been considered a god. <laughs> now, everybody can do it on their laptop. Or if you, the students, sat on a park bench and took something of this size and talked to someone in China, you would be considered a god. But in fact, uh, you are simply exercising the tools of globalization that are now available uh, to uh, almost everybody in our country. And the question then is how to think about uh, globalization. And I think it presents four different challenges. It's obviously a huge topic, but let me suggest four ways to look at it. One is historical, conceptual, policy, and pedagogical. In other words, how do you teach globalization? So let's start conceptually. What exactly is globalization? Well, the economist uh, puts it provocatively, the most abused word of the 21st century. Webster's, uh, in a much more uh, even-handed way, a process that renders uh, various activities and aspirations worldwide in scope and application. Or as Tom Friedman of the New York Times put it, the world is flat characterized now by global information, interdependence, and interconnectedness through uh, the globalization of markets, the globalization of rights, the globalization of governance, and the globalization of connections. Now, <coughs> uh, I in particular think about law and globalization as having three faces. Uh, one is the law of globalization. Globalization has become its own subject, so if you want to teach globalization, you have to teach it as a mixed international and domestic subject like human rights or international business transactions. Um, for example, many things that we have uh, in our domestic environment are the products of an international environment. So it's not necessarily something that lends itself to either the domestic or the international uh, curriculum. Law as globalization uh, is proof that globalization is occurring in the same way as culture as globalization, music as globalization. And as a Korean American, I'm struck by the fact that Gangnam Style <laughs> has more than one billion hits on the internet when most people had never heard of Gangnam before. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually quite a weird video, but it's <laughs> been viewed a billion times, most of that by members of my own family. <laughs> So culture has globalized. In fact, uh, many uh, young American children are now familiar with co the Korean phrases uh, in the song. Uh, and law operates the same way. Uh, it is a, uh, a tool of globalization, or it's an example or proof that globalization is occurring. Uh, the same standards uh, appear not just in US law, but in every part of the world. Uh, liberty, equality, privacy, um, and it is proof of how globalization is occurring. And a third dimension is the law in globalization, which is what function does the law have in affecting the process of globalization? And in particular, what I call the process of humane globalization or globalization with the human face. By which I mean, um, when we talk about teaching globalization, I don't think we're just talking about teaching the phenomenon of globalization. Teaching the phenomenon of globalization is like teaching the phenomenon of the sun coming up in the morning. Globalization is going to happen. It is inevitable. Uh, what is unclear is whether it will positively or negatively affect human rights, liberty, equality, privacy, and development, particularly for the bottom billion of the world's population. Uh, in other words, uh, globalization can exacerbate inequality, invade privacy, infringe upon liberty, take away from human rights, or it could do the opposite. And it has to be managed collectively by many, many, many forces to go in one direction or the other. So I ask, how can universities and law schools, like the University of Baltimore, 
and its logical promote globalization with a human face or a humane process of globalization, how can this process promote human rights, international justice, democracy, and the rule of law? Now, turning from a conceptual perspective to a historical perspective, think about the evolution of global law. And while international law has a, a long, majestic history, going back to uh, the uh, Justinian and the um, Greeks and the Romans and the early Christian thinkers, uh, Vattel, um, it actually came to fruition as a customary subject under the time of Hugo Grotius, but largely as customary law until a series of positive law instruments were adopted. And then the Big Bang was, of course, the 40s and the UN Charter and the creation of an ambitious system of institutions and constitutions. On the political side, the UN system and the regional organizations associated with it, like uh, the Organization of American States, later the European Coal and Steel Community, uh, the uh, African, uh, what became later the African Union, uh, the Arab League, with a general goal of no more war. And on the economic side, the Bretton Woods system, with a general goal of no more depression. Because after all, the 30s had been marked by both war and global depression. And it was the Bretton Woods system with the World Bank the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs of Trade, later the WTO, uh, and um, the uh, 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 International Monetary Fund to manage monetary flows that was designed to prevent this from happening again. During the period from 1941, marked by Franklin Roosevelt's War Freedom Speech to the mid-50s, was what I call the era of universalization of norms. Uh, there's a lot of uh, de declaration of rules, norms that gave rise to treaty structures. And then in 1956 to 76, a period where there's a creation of many institutions at the international level and the intergovernmental level and the non-governmental organization level to try to address these concerns. And then from 76 to 89, uh, the norms and the institutions started to work together. It could be thought of as a, a period where the machines started to crank. And <coughs> that led to 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dramatic expansion of global freedom, uh, a tremendous sense of global optimism, which reigned for the first 10 years. And then you all know what happened next, 2001, uh, the 9-11, and suddenly extraordinary pessimism set in. We saw that the very tools of globalization, positive globalization, could also lead to negative consequences. The same freedom of transportation that led to people being able to fly around the world would allow people to turn airplanes into bombs and fly them into our most important buildings that the tools of the internet could be used to uh, support financing of terrorist activities. Uh, and then a sharp turning away from globalization as a positive force. And then now a period in which we've been living for the last four years, what I would call a period of global recovery, uh, an attempt again to try to develop an affirmative strategy. Now, <coughs> in particular, the post-Berlin Wall period, the post-Cold War period, was marked by a number of positive developments, the, what I call the globalization of freedom across Latin America, South Africa, Central and Eastern Europe, the revival of international criminal adjudication at the Yugoslav Rwanda Tribunal, uh, the adoption in 1998 of the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the expansion of regional systems to address regional conflicts, the Vienna Conference on Human Rights in 1993, which created a high commissioner for human rights and a revival of US human rights policy through ratification of a number of treaties, the Convention Against Torture, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Race Discrimination Convention, and efforts to promote human rights in a number of disparate places. 
with a number of successes, East Timor, Kosovo, eventually Bosnia, and then a number of high-profile failures, Rwanda, Cambodia, Iraq. Uh, <coughs> and at the dawn of the 21st century, there seemed to be a viable global strategy which would balance a number of things, diplomacy and force, with diplomacy backed by force in service of human rights, the most prominent example being the Dayton Peace Accords, power and principle, where human rights principles would be used as a source of soft power, uh, the blending of international, national, public, and private institutions to work together in standard setting and implementation of human rights and humanitarian norms, and a focus on the past, present, and future accountability for past growth violations, stopping atrocities as they occur, and democracy building to build healthier systems to the future. And <coughs> But the next 10 years, from 2001 to 2011, this period of global pessimism was marked by a number of important shifts from diplomacy backed by force to force backed rarely by diplomacy or much less by diplomacy, the use of hard power uh, at the expense of soft power, uh, insufficient steps to strengthen multilateral and regional institutions, uh, in a number of different areas, turning away from a number of organizations. That meant that in the last four years, we needed a new strategy. And <clears throat> the important thing to see is that what the Obama administration tried to do is to announce that strategy. Many people still have not heard the message. But message number one is principled engagement, to recognize that a new era of engagement has begun Respecting the law, living our values doesn't make us weaker, it makes us safer, it makes us stronger. This is the, see, the, the uh, theme of President Obama's Nobel Peace Prize lecture in December 2009. And then my boss, Secretary Clinton, uh, coined the phrase smart power in her opening speech, the notion that the U.S. should use a full range of tools, not just defense, but diplomacy, development, respect for the law, human rights, and pu public-private partnerships, as she defined it, uh, responding to opportunities, not just threats, using tools of cooperation over confrontation, looking for new partners, public as well as private partners, and ways to lead, always looking for the nexus between the domestic and the international, and most important, preserving our values. In other words, keeping our focus not just on what we're fighting against, but what we're fighting for, our values of tolerance, equality, opportunity, rights and the rule of law. Now I would argue that from this first term has emerged uh, a theory, a smart power theory which I call the emerging Obama-Clinton doctrine. And it has three simple elements, engage, translate and leverage. Principled engagement with all comers, Diplomacy and legal compliance as elements of smart power, translating legal rules to the current day situation, and leverage, leveraging these legal rules into multilateral responses. Um, <coughs> what exactly does this mean? One is that the United States is not an isolationist. It engages with all entities, public, private, bilaterally or multilaterally, internationally or domestically. As a matter of translation, think of this. Most of our laws are out of date. Most of our treaties were, framework treaties were adopted after World War II. Most of the national security laws were adopted after Vietnam. That's 40 years ago. Much of what we faced when I was at the State Department simply is not addressed by the laws that we have. The laws have not been updated. When they talk about armed conflict in cyberspace, you don't find that in the Geneva Conventions, which led to two possible responses, and you could figure out who adopted which. One is what I call a black hole response. If the laws that are on the books don't address these situations, there must be no law, no law to apply, which means we do whatever we want, or the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, as. Thucydides said in the Peloponnesian War. So if there was no clear law to apply in Guantanamo, 
We don't apply law in Guantanamo. Or if there's no clear law to apply in cyberspace, we're free of law. The other approach, as opposed to the black hole approach, is what I call translation, or what Montesquieu called the spirit of the laws. In other words, trying to translate from the laws that exist, like the Geneva Conventions, to new situations like armed conflict against non-state actors like Al-Qaeda. Um, in other words, trying to adopt or modify our response so that we're compliant with the law, even if the law doesn't explicitly express the circumstance. And then using our legal engagement to combine with other kinds of tools to achieve certain outcomes and global governance mechanisms. Now this might seem abstract, so let me just give you some examples very quickly. And then I'll turn to the final question, the pedagogical question of teaching globalization. Take, for the example, the incident of Chen Guangchen, uh, Burma, the rights of LGBT people, Arab Spring, Libya, and a number of issues involving globalization, particularly counterterrorism, global economy. Uh, take, for example, the famous case of Chen Guangchen. Uh, he's a dissident in China with whom I spent 14 days while I was in Beijing. He was essentially under house arrest in his home in Shandong. He fled to Beijing and asked to enter our em embassy. Now, the United States could have turned him away <coughs> or said, just go back. Uh, instead, we engaged and we invited him to come into the embassy. But we had to put forward a legal rationale that would explain why every Chinese dissident didn't have a right to come in. We asserted the right of the United States to admit him not his human right to enter. And then, over the course of the next period, we translated practices from the old days, when people have a choice of being either inside a country, but dead to the world, or outside their country, and dead to their home. And we understood that in the modern day scenario, you can be outside of China, and communicating with the human rights community inside through the internet. And then we uh, worked out an arrangement with the NYU campus where he could go first to their campus in China. And if that did not work, to the United States, to the NYU campus here, using their globalization strategy to give him some set of assurances. So <laughs> engage, translate, and leverage led to a positive outcome. We engaged both with him and with the Chinese government and we think have now put him in a better place without damaging the relationship with China. And in fact, that um, when they arrived in New York, which is what we're doing here, um, uh, they gave us all T-shirts, which had pictures of his sunglasses. And it said, Chen Guang Chen, his wishes are values, uh, as an expression of how we tried to address that situation. Taking another example, the remarkable situation with Burma, the extraordinary Nobel Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest for many years. We engaged both with her and with the Burmese regime. We set forth an action for action policy where we engaged in pragmatic dialogue with the regime. We obtained the release of 800 political prisoners. And then uh, as she was elected to the parliament and many, many members of her party the same and elected to the rule of law committee, we have developed an exit strategy for uh, potential easing of the smart sanctions as a way of uh, signaling that further opening is more welcome. We've done the same in a number of other regional initiatives, and I could say more in the question and answer period. <coughs> it has led to uh, declining military engagements in Afghanistan. Uh, and Iraq, but both combined with continuing civilian engagement and promotion of development of civil society. And then the greatest challenge, Arab Spring, where we've noticed that many people are pushing for democracy, human rights, fulfilling their own opportunities at home. The most interesting thing is that this group of people generally is not interested in terrorist activity. They're interested in greater freedom at home. Take, for example, Libya, 
uh, one of the most complicated situations we faced. There, uh, hard power, namely U.S. involvement with a multinational coalition was used in conjunction with many other tools, sanctions, recognition, derecognition, freeing of frozen assets, visa control, controls on chemical weapons to bring about uh, the um, ouster of Gaddafi. And we have the current crisis in Syria, which everyone knows is a sad but not identical situation, particularly because of the absence of a Security Council resolution, uh, the need for sustained diplomacy through the Special Representative Lakhdar Brahimi, an effort to engage the Syrian opposition and give them non-lethal support, promotion of accountability mechanisms where possible. And finally, with regard to the controversial issue of counterterrorism, the administration on the 10th anniversary of September 11th framed a two-part approach in the short term, continuing efforts to degrade Al-Qaeda and its associated forces, but a longer term challenge, which is to counter its ideology, propaganda, diminish its appeal, finding new partners. And so President Obama in two speeches set forth the need to use force consistent with rules of conduct, maintaining a standard bearer the emerging strategy has been pretty simple. If there are three globalizations, the globalization of governance, the globalization of freedom, and the globalization of terror, how to use the first two to combat the third. And <coughs> perhaps the thing most uh, uh, least well understood about the administration's overall approach is that the United States does not claim anymore to be in a global war on terror. It is in an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban and Associated Forces, a group of about 3,000 people. Um, that's occurring through a number of different mechanisms, targeting detention, lawful conditions of detention, lawful cooperations with nation states for law enforcement purposes, with a focus particularly on humane treatment, absolutely no torture or other kinds of abuse. Now, <clears throat> at the same time, we have a huge transition in the global economy. Law firms are increasingly becoming transnational. Transnational firms are adopting global forms, which lead law schools to face a question as to how to address questions not just of public international law, but private international law. And even though the issues I've just flashed through occupied a significant amount of my time as legal advisor, I spent a comparable amount of time on lower profile issues like choice of courts agreements, online dispute resolution, and inter internet uh, commerce, um, e-commerce, uh, and other mechanisms that will allow the global economy to move faster using the internet. So here is our pedagogical challenge, because at American law schools, uh, we are still teaching the subject as if we were in the 18th century. In 1789, Jeremy Bentham talked about international law, and he set forth what we call the matrix, from public law to private law, domestic to international. And we all know this, law students all know this. Private domestic law is torts, contracts, property. Public domestic law is constitutional law and criminal law. Public international law is treaties. Private international law is international commercial transactions. Uh, and we still teach the law this way. And <coughs> we view domestic law as separate from international law. Domestic is here, international is there. We view public law, the law of governments, as separate from private law. So public law is up here and private law is here. Well, <laughs> guess what? Uh, we all learned uh, from Keanu Reeves the matrix is a construct. Uh, it has been imposed on a much less tidy reality uh, as a way of explaining simplistic things to the world. Uh, my major suggestion would be that 21st century legal education should reject this matrix because it's a construct that doesn't fit modern legal reality. So most law is now transnational law. It's not out at the margins, it's in the middle. It's kind of hybrid law, it's a law that crosses 
boundaries. It's a law that transcends these dichotomies. U.S. foreign relations law, international criminal law, the law of merchant or legal commerce, intellectual property law, all runs into the middle. And most of what we're teaching in the area of global law is in this vast middle, not clearly public or private, and not clearly domestic or international. Now, the phrase transnational law coined by Philip Jessup, judge of the ICJ, uh, and also former Columbia law professor, talked about law that regulates actions or events that transcend national frontiers, including public and private international law and other rules that don't fit into these categories. It's a kind of hybrid law. So just think of this. Is dot com a domestic concept or an international concept? It's both, right? Uh, domestic companies are dot coms, but foreign companies are also dot coms. Or take another one, the metric system. Is that an international concept or a domestic concept? If you go over to Camden Yards, you look out at left field, and sure enough, they have the distance from home plate to the wall in the metric system. It's followed in the United States, but it's also followed in every country in the world. And I would suggest that transnational law be given an operational or a kind of a cyber defini definition. It can be downloaded. So take, for example, disappearance, the norm against disappearance. Disappearance is different from arbitrary killing or extrajudicial killing. When someone has disappeared, they just vanish. And partly it's to terrify their family members. This phrase was first publicized in the 70s in Latin America, and then extended to the Middle East. And now it's a universal idea. Someone was disappeared, whether in Belarus or uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Another possibility is law that was uploaded, then downloaded. For example, the US Constitution has guarantees of free trial and due process of law that have become internationalized into instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, and then have been downloaded to other countries in the world. Or horizontally transplanted, borrowed or horizontally transplanted from one system to another. For example, the right to privacy is an idea that uh, has been pioneered in some jurisdictions and now regularly quoted in others. And I would like to suggest that there is an emergence of something I would call transnational public law. On the private side, there are a number of concepts like corruption um, that uh, became known as concepts that had transnational private law meaning, letters of credit, uh, uniform uh, customs and practices with regard to commercial transactions. On the public side, cruel and usual punishment or cruel and human or degrading treatment has become a transnational public law concept. Civil society has become a transnational public concept. In refugee and immigration law, the concept of the internally displaced who do not cross borders has become a transnational public concept. Trafficking in international criminal law has become a transnational concept. People understand what this means, but it's not clear it's rooted in any particular system. Which leads me to the question, what does it mean for our law school curriculum? When I was dean at Yale Law School, I studied the course catalog over dozens of years. And what became clear to me was we taught Connecticut law at Yale until the 40s. And then as the New Deal became important, the faculty and the administration made a collective decision to not focus so much on local law and to focus more on national law because the United States was becoming a global power and therefore our national constitutional law was more important for people to understand than particular bodies of law in Connecticut. What I would argue is that the exact same moment has arrived on the global stage. Uh, the major shift will be away from domestic law toward emerging subjects of transnational public law. So what does this mean? This now embraces a range of subjects that are being taught in almost every law school in the country, 
In each of these areas, global standards are being recognized, integrated, and internalized into domestic legal systems. And I've argued that in addition to substance is what I would call a transnational legal process, a process of internalization of norms uh, by which these international rules are brought home. So let me just give you an example. Torture. The norm against torture and cruel and humor-grading treatment started as a common law prohibition. It became constitutionalized in the Eighth Amendment as part of the notion of cruel and unusual punishment. In 1958, the Supreme Court, in a case called Trope versus Bellis, connected it to evolving international standards of decency. It was connected to the Fifth Amendment idea of due process. This was uploaded to international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenant on Civil Pro Political Rights Convention Against Torture, and Cruel and Humor Degrading Treatment. It's been transplanted to other jurisdictions, the European Convention on Human Rights. It's been downloaded into US jurisprudence, the famous line of cases from a Philartica. It's been downloaded legislatively by Congress into the Torture Victims Protection Act and others. In the last administration, there were a number of juridical moments that tried to oust this norm, but these were essentially reversed by the Supreme Court in the Hamdan case by Congress in the Detainee Treatment Act and now President Obama in three executive orders in January 2009. So how can law schools now promote this globalization with regard to curriculum students scholarship and law programs. I think there's an emerging transnational public law curriculum which are going to become increasingly important in every law school in the country. Uh, <coughs> human rights, dispute resolution, governance, the law of global democracy and development, environment, public health, and the movement of peoples. How can this be done? Take the first year legal curriculum. Right now we teach torts, car accidents. Maybe we should teach transnational torts like alien tort claims, suits for torture. We teach criminal law like burglary. Maybe we should teach drug trafficking or trafficking in persons or the Pinochet case. We teach civil procedure, federal and state, maybe we should teach the relationship between domestic and international courts, like the relationship between the International Court of Justice and the US courts. In constitutional law, we should be teaching comparative constitutionalism, as we've seen it play out in the uh, so-called war on terror. And transnational law, understanding the basic relations between treaties, customary international law, international organizations, and regimes. <coughs> In the advanced curriculum, I think we're increasingly seeing students going overseas. That their advanced curriculum is built out of a combination of domestic and international courses. Advanced courses can build on these developments, and then there are clinical courses that prepare students for international legal practice. One huge growth area on which virtually every law school in the United States will be called upon in the next few years is with regard to rule of law in Burma. Um, Anton Suchi has called upon outside uh, legal institutions to help her build a rule of law consciousness through the work of clinical activities by students, including, for example, just doing research here in Baltimore that can be used in Burma, or summer and postgraduate international fellowships. And I think that. Uh, we will be increasingly looking to promote a new generation, global awareness, uh, more students with foreign language and overseas experience, more foreign graduate programs. We were talking at dinner last night about how many Korean students who used to go to Germany are now coming to the United States, more summer and internship programs, other kinds of subspecialties in our graduate programs the creation of worldwide networks among graduate LLMs and JSDs. It may well be that the future of law schools in America is to take in students like my father, uh, who had finished their career in Korea and realized that's not enough. Uh, they want to study here in the United States. Or to do joint degree programs with foreign law schools, where they can do a couple semesters here and a couple semesters over there. Other programs that we could work on collectively, I know your CICL is doing some of these. Visiting professors from abroad and exchanges, more visitors from practice, expanded interdisciplinary connections, more partnerships, particularly regional kind with regard to 
uh, Sealy type efforts, the Central and Eastern European Law Initiative with regard to Arab Spring countries. A country like Tunisia or Bahrain or Algiers could very much benefit. And then we have this very fascinating scenario, which is that traditional libraries no longer are physically located in any one place. You could have a single portal and consortiums of schools and different schools can put on their servers the documents they care about. And you can enter, for example, through what we call at Yale the Artemis Project, also the Diana Project, to make sure that all human rights instruments are online. Such a project is going on now with regard to recording the um, Proceedings of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the internet and its associated tools make this phenomenally interesting. So for example, at Yale we have the online resources of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If someone talks about violence against women on, as they're talking in a, a video interview, you can click on it, it goes to the transcript and there's a hyperlink to the word violence against women. You click on that and you suddenly go to uh, sections of the transcript as well as other international instruments that address this as a global topic. And this essentially creates a concordance so that <coughs> these databases can be used to create a jurisprudence on this subject uh, even though the materials are never physically organized in one place. And I think that in time, the 21st century cu curriculum will turn on such issues as global democracy, governance, transnational crime, instead of tort, transnational injury and redress, instead of corporations, transnational markets, instead of civil procedure, transnational dispute resolution. There are some universities that are already beginning to teach these courses uh, for example, the uh, P Peking University at Shenzhen has started to pioneer an entirely transnational program. The same goes for a number of law schools in India. And the question is, when will the United States find law schools that are ready to do the same? And <coughs> like the State Department, which has regional programs and subject matter programs, we will eventually find, I think, many law schools replicating uh, particular areas of regional awareness. American University Law School under the brilliant leadership of Dean Claudio Grossman has become a great expert on uh, Western Hemisphere law. But then there are also subject matter programs on topics like rights, global constitutionalism, business and corporation law, information society, global health and global environment. What about scholarship? I think that more scholarship can address the role of law in global affairs I've already suggested the transnational legal process, which is a subject I've written about extensively as one of these areas. Also the rise of transnational public law. I do believe that more practice-oriented scholarship is becoming more and more necessary. Uh, in returning to the academy, I find that Fred Rodell, a famous Yale law professor, once said there are two things wrong with legal scholarship, its form and its content. Uh, the form problem here is it's too long, it's too complex, it's unfriendly to users, it's too focused on the U.S., it's too inside baseball driven with jargon, too many footnotes, too many long and confusing titles. The content, under-edited, lacking clear thesis, never explains why we should care, sometimes pits a non-question and gives a non-answer to it. And most frustrating to me when I was in the government was I found it unconnected to the practice of international law often because the professors have themselves had little or no experience, and it's become increasingly policy irrelevant, namely useless to solving problems to which policymakers are seeking answers. <coughs> I think that we have actually driven younger scholars to go into teaching without having practiced international law. I think that this is a mistake because the influence of law in international affairs is hard to measure when political decisions are often made in the shadow of the law. So international relations theories try to count treaties or other kinds of empirical examples, but sometimes you can't measure what's important. A famous expression, when you can't measure what's important, you make important what you can measure. And therefore, the international relations scholarship often reads like looking 
uh, for my wristwatch over there. Why? Because the light is better, not because that's where the problem really is. And I think the real problem is that when you go into practice for a number of years, as I did for the last four years, you understand that issues are nested in a bigger picture. Lawyers play changing roles. Lawyers can expand policy options. And most important, you see issues of the interconnectedness between issues uh, and proportions that follow from them. Take, for example, uh, the Arctic. Consider this phenomenon. Because of people's use of fossil fuels, it, it's getting warmer. Because it's getting warmer, the Arctic ice cap is melting. Because the Arctic ice cap is melting, people can sail deeper into the Arctic, looking down at the continental shelf, where they have a choice as to whether they're going to reap more fossil fuels. And therefore, this interconnectedness is exactly the kind of legal issue that you need to see in proportion. I mention this because when you look at some of the great lawyers of the post-war period, Louis Stone, Dean Rothschild, uh, Abe Shays of Harvard, Dean Rusk, former Secretary of State Lou Hankin, Rosalind Higgins, Oscar Schachter, Nick Katzenbach, all of them had very substantial experience, not just as scholars, but as lawyers. And I think that that's something we need to bring back into the academy. So I'm telling deans and professors, you should consider this a plus in there um, uh, as to whether somebody gets hired. To me, legal practice in the international realm is more important than a PhD in an unrelated field. So because I'm no longer on the appointments committee and no longer dean, I'm free to tell you this. I was considered a great expert in international law, and I went to the US government, and I realized that I didn't know very much. Now, <coughs> what should universities do more broadly? And here's where I'll bring it to an end. Uh, diagnostically, I think we need to better understand how such fields as the University of Baltimore campuses are addressing law, business, public affairs, are adjusting to the process of globalization. And then a prescriptive question, talking about the challenge of globalization with the human face. How can universities help our government officials to manage this process and governance? And I say help our elected officials because you may have noticed uh, our elected officials are not getting a lot done. Maybe some of them are, but not on the legislative side, not inside the beltway. And <laughs> it is my judgment that in the 60s, the domestic civil rights movement uh, Brown versus the board and its progeny, the push for equality, the link to international affairs, became a defining lens for legal education in the 60s and 70s. And in the same way, I think human rights is going to become a defining lens for legal education in the 21st century. And we as educators, scholars, and lawyers then need to conceive of our mission as influencing a process of humane globalization, serving justice, advancing freedom, promoting public service, courting a transnational civil society. And here is a sobering thought in this age. This is simply too important to leave to elected officials. Their goal is to get reelected. Uh, they're not going to focus on timeless questions, and they're not going to tackle hard problems. The most likely outcome is short-term fixes, that get, get us to the next political crisis. But we, as people who have a privilege to live in a university setting, can start to think of ourselves as global citizens. And one more proof of that is there than, for example, Coney 2012, where millions of children in America suddenly found themselves deeply connected to those children who were being affected by Joseph Coney and the Lord's Resistance Army. I think that building a global curriculum, thinking about these issues creatively, we can work together to become part of global civil society to build a process of humane globalization. These are just some initial thoughts, I think, worthy of Chancellor Langenberg, worthy of this university system. Um, I'm honored to have been here. I'm proud to have been here with the recipient of the Langenberg Award, and uh, thank you very much.
Professor Ku, let me uh, thank you for a very profound and thought-provoking uh, lecture. I have to say I also found it reassuring in a way as a mathematician because uh, I've long thought that we in mathematics are wedded to old forms of pedagogy and that we need to change. So it's reassuring to know that we're not the only discipline uh, that needs, uh, ne needs these uh, changes. Uh, Professor Ku has agreed to take uh, some questions and, and I, I want to take the privilege of, since I'm here, of asking the first question, but then we'll see uh, others in the audience. Um, uh, you know, you, you put forth sort of an exciting uh, uh, agenda for curricular reform and a new way of thinking about uh, legal education. To what extent do you think the accreditation process, the rigidity of that, would, will be an obstacle uh, or can it be a catalyst for the kind of changes you're, you're uh, suggesting? Thank you, Chancellor. That's an excellent question. You know, one fruitful avenue of change is the multi-state bar exam. After all, the contract section asks questions about domestic contracts that are concluded entirely within the state of Maryland, when increasingly contracts in almost every variety are transnational. When, when I download an app on iTunes and I click on the accept conditions, next time go look. <laughs> you know, a lot of these apps are made elsewhere than in your home state. <laughs> I mean, frankly, most of them are made in about a five mile radius between Modesto and Cupertino or whatever. <laughs> but, but you s find yourself selecting the forum of choice, which is some California state court. So why not have questions on the multi-state bar exam that address transnational contracts? Um, the Supreme Court held in the Lawrence case that uh, in evaluating whether equal protection permits the criminalization of same-sex sodomy is relevant to look to the practices of the European Court of Human Rights. So it may well be that some of these precedents are relevant uh, to what we're doing. We just filed a brief in Perry, the same-sex marriage case involving Proposition 8, uh, arguing that what was essentially happening was a return by Proposition 8 of gay and lesbian couples to a separate but equal status, where they were penalized for their sexual orientation by uh, being asked to choose uh, between civil unions and not the full equal status of marriage, it's obvious that as a legal matter, you're entitled to equality. You could, as a religious matter, be told by your church that you're not entitled to the full religious uh, celebration. And that's a good way, it seems to me, to split the difference. Another way that your accreditation process, I think, could play in is the way that um, the ABA accredits schools. Um, for example, a school in upstate New York has to know about Canadian law. Um, a school in Louisiana has to know about French law. So why is it that um, um, the ABA doesn't have uh, international standards with regard to its accreditation process? So I think what's happening is that um, lawyers who are trained in the old way determine that traditional ways of teaching are the most critical ways of doing things, and I think it's frankly holding back uh, the evolution. Now, I think it's up to a couple of entrepreneurial schools to pick some areas of these and sort of break out on these. I, I mentioned uh, Claudia Grossman because there are many law schools in D.C., and their school had an existing strength in Latin American law, and they have really now made that uh, a huge advantage. If you want to study inter-American human rights law, you should go to their summer academy. Uh, if you want to do transfer programs or meet professors, it's a good place to go. So they've identified this as a particular area in which they can specialize. Um, 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't their specialty. And I think we have a lot of law schools that are looking for a distinctive voice, and that's one way you can find them.
you will, a little more about your perspective on another sort of law and thinking about religious law. Strong adherence of religious laws commonly perceive them as overriding and superseding any civil law, not to mention the religious laws of other groups. Uh, we see a lot of that in the Middle East these days. We see some of it even in our own country. How do we deal with that and can law education do anything to address that problem? Uh, it's an excellent question. I guess I have three answers. One, um, in terms of imparting ethics, law is, I would say, a secondary means of imparting ethical codes. Religion is number one. Well, you know, the reason that most people don't steal things from other people, even if they're available, you know, I'd love to walk away with this wireless, <laughs> is not because I fear being caught. It's because I've internalized certain ethical codes, and they have to come mainly from religion or moral training, which law only reinforces. So, you know, the, if there was no policeman around, I still wouldn't take it. Now, <coughs> that having been said, in countries where there's not much pluralism with regard to religion or their state religions, the religion can become oppressive or used as a tool for suppressing human rights. In fact, blatant discrimination can parade under the banner of religious law and has frequently done so. I mean, what is the scenario under which it makes sense for the Taliban to deprive half of the country of education for 10 years in the name of fundamentalism? And many Islamic scholars have pointed out the ways in which this is not mandated. A third point is that uh, one of the things that happened during my own confirmation process is I was accused of urging that Sharia law be a dominant form of law to be taught in American law schools. What had actually happened was I had gone to uh, an alumni event, and I was asked whether students in our school understood Sharia law, and I said, yeah, many of them do. And not the least of it, because many of them work in companies that do business in the Middle East. Those Middle Eastern countries have contracts, and those contracts select the law, and the law they select is Sharia law. And when I was interrogated about this on my confirmation hearing, I said to the senator, Senator, if a Fortune 500 company in your state uh, had someone who didn't know comparative law, you would say that the general counsel is um, unfit to serve. And you're asking me to be the general counsel of the largest, the leading international law firm for the State Department, the leading country, leading uh, diplomatic power in the world. How can I not know this? So <coughs> I think that um, uh, religious law is taught in many different ways. Often what happens is that the codes and credos of the religious code are taught as a separate system and then contrasted to the civil system. Uh, and then the question is always the same, which is, you know, render unto Caesar that that's Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. I mean, I think, for example, the solution on same-sex marriage is, or the one that we urge through the Supreme Court, to deny one group of people a legal status that's available to everybody else is separate but equal. I thought we rejected that in 1952. If people have an equal legal status, or right, legal right to be married, some churches can decide as a matter of religious freedom to admit some people to those statuses or not. And they could argue that that's protected as a religious right. So the question is whether you can with withhold legal recognition, not whether people are entitled to, to certain statuses within the church, which each church is entitled to dispense on its own. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dean Cole, for your remarks. I'm Morad Egbal, previously at the Center for International and Comparative Law, now with Plasma Technologies, LLC. 
And I have one observation and two questions, if I may. Uh, the observation I had is that in your remarks uh, that you offered, uh, the law school here had designed a program 10 years ago to attract foreign lawyers, uh, foreign academicians, and foreign judges to train them exactly in the way that you suggested it should be done. And I'm very encouraged by that foresight of the law school to run a program like that. And I'm grateful to both, Dean, uh, to both Chancellor Langenberg and Chancellor Kerwin for their support in making that program happen. The two questions I have, I'll be brief. One is goes to your experience at the um, uh, State Department and the Legal Advisor's Office. There is perceived to be a tension between the State Department, the Department of Defense, and the White House in their respective legal advisor's offices. Even though we uh, look upon the legal advisor's office in the State Department as the preeminent interpreter of international law. So do, so do I. Yes, of, of course. Uh, my question to you is, would you care to make a few observations about how it, it played itself out in the way the questions come up? Do you get the first call? Does the White House get the f uh, first call? And the second question I have is, uh, in your remarks, and both uh, uh, Chancellor Langenberg alluded to it, I felt missing the interface, the articulation between Islamic law, which is a legal system, it's been around for 1300 years, but it's perceived as a religious law, but it really isn't. It is a well-working uh, system. And do you have any office where between the Western world and the Eastern world, if I can phrase it that way, the articulation lies? You said something at the end about if a corporation wants to write their contract according to Sharia law, we need to know something about Sharia law. Maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you. Um, well, number one, you know, the legal advisor's office has traditionally been the prime interpreter of international law for the U.S. government in opinions and other kinds of testimony or public expositions. Um, my own view is that the legal advisor's office has a duty to explain why our positions are consistent with international law, which is something that I tried to do. Um, there are other leading law offices of the US government that might read the exact same treaty differently. And particularly if you're engaged in a translation exercise, uh, there will be differences of view. Sometimes there are good faith differences. Usually there are good faith differences. So take, take the example. The Geneva Conventions imagines two kinds of armed conflicts international armed conflicts between two nation states, you know, the United States versus Germany or the United States versus Japan in World War II. And then they imagine a second set of conflicts called non-international armed conflicts, which are essentially civil wars. So for example, um, the government of Colombia against the FARC within the borders of Colombia. So the question is, where do you fit an armed conflict between the United States and a transnational non-state actor like Al-Qaeda. You know, Al-Qaeda is not a nation state, but it operates across borders. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled that this is a non-international armed conflict, but it's clearly n different from a non-international armed co conflict of a civil war kind. So a lot of the legal interpretations that we were engaged during my time at the State Department is translation of rules to a particular setting, and then other agencies might do a different kind of translation. There's kind of a dialectical process. I, I generally thought that these were done entirely in good faith. You know, when you're doing translation, translators tend to disagree. But there is a mechanism for resolving it, which is you take it to an interagency process. It goes through uh, the National Security Council, Legal Advisor, the White House Council, and often the President chooses himself, which he did a number of times. Uh, I fully agree with you that there's a difference between religious law and Islamic law. And Islamic law is followed in a very, very large percentage of the world and governs a, an extraordinarily large percentage of the human transactions that occur. Now, one thing I've always noticed is that um, foreigners tend to know a lot more about U.S. law than U.S lawyers in law schools know about foreign law, um, partly because we perceive our, of ourselves as kind of a middle kingdom. But I do think that that needs to, to end. Um, and that, uh, you know, simply to offer a course where 
someone in the community who teaches a course and interested students can take it can yield extraordinary outcomes. When, when I was uh, the chairman of our visiting lecturers committee, it turned out no one had taught a course on Islamic law. So we went out and found somebody and then that person taught for a year, then we learned that there was another person who was even better known who was willing to do it and now we have a regular curriculum and a search for Islamic law has been part of the search agenda of the appointments committee during many years in which I was dean. You know, we had regular visitors and I, I think it's, um, you know, a very uh, salutary trend. The students just come away informed in a way, you know, at the end of the day, students are consumers and they consume what's offered to them. And if you're serving up Connecticut law, that's all they're getting. <laughs> uh, if you're serving up Islamic law, uh, a lot of them will consume that too. And it will actually change the way in which they view their opportunities, the places they want to go work in the summer, uh, the way they present themselves um, for jobs, and extraordinary set of possibilities. A final example, my nephew, who's a Korean American, his mother is Lebanese American. And when he was leaving um, law school, he was thinking about working at a firm and then the firm asked him to come back in a year. So the question was, what is he gonna do? And at first he told me, I'll work in a firm somewhere else or volunteer here in Washington. And I said to him, you know, why don't you go overseas? Um, this is your moment. And he went to The Hague and he fir worked first for the ICC, the International Criminal Court. His <coughs> first boss was Korean. Because he speaks Le uh, Arabic, he then went to work for the Lebanon Tribunal. And now he's back working for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. His perspective on the world has entirely changed and he hasn't gone back to the firm. <laughs> Uh, well, the black hole approach means you can get away with it this time. It means they're less likely to be trusting of you going forward. The whole notion of a soft power, a smart power or soft power approach recognizes a simple reality, which is that no nation state has the hard power to get and work its will through force alone. And, you know, the United States has military capabilities unparalleled, and its soldiers are tapped out. You know, th they've served and re-upped a number of times. Uh, there's a great reluctance to use boots on the ground anywhere in the world. But <coughs> if you do things within a frame of law, then the law is on your side. You can bring in notions of international legitimacy and do a collective operation. That explains our Libya intervention. You know, the United States came in for the military phase of this simply to establish a no-fly zone. And then other countries took the lead. And it was called by some leading from behind. It was derided, but guess what? It worked. And part of it is because the United States shared this responsibility and used a multiplicity of tools. And my point is they are much more likely to join us and follow us if they think we're respecting the same rules they are and that we're not following double standards. In cyberspace, for example, China will, is very reluctant to acknowledge that they're in a zone where law applies. And as a result, it's partly because they have such extraordinary capabilities in cyberspace. But this is a very good moment for the United States to actually put norms forward and get the Chinese to buy into it because it's such an early stage. It's just like with regard to any other advanced weapons. And obviously the same goes for drones. 
The United States has a technological lead there, but it's not gonna last long. And so putting out normative standards publicly and following them, I think is a very good and critically important step because I do think that drones can be used lawfully or they can use, be used unlawfully. And it's a mistake to say they're always being used lawfully and it's a mistake to say they're always being used unlawfully. So setting forth the standards in a clear way gets people behind uh, this. And if they feel that you can distinguish between an illegal use and a legal use, um, they're much more likely to support us in those uses of those tools which we find critically necessary for national security purposes. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank <laughs> you.